Hello everybody and welcome to Med A's. In this chapter we will talk about the principles of cancer biology, tumor suppressors, and oncogenes. Okay, so let's start with tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes code for proteins which function to control cell division. In other words, they tend to make proteins which stop cell division and only allow it to occur when needed. Mutations which lead to loss of function of tumor suppressor genes increase the risk of cancer by allowing cells to bypass the mechanisms in place which normally control cell division. In a nutshell, tumor suppressor genes make sure cells only undergo cell division when they are ready. They act to control cell division. So how do tumor suppressor genes ensure that cell division only occurs when necessary? In order to better understand this, we need to understand the function of the proteins coded by tumor suppressor genes. Broadly speaking, tumor suppressor genes code for two kinds of proteins. The first kind is proteins involved in preventing cell cycle progression. These are known as gatekeepers. The second kind of proteins are proteins involved in repairing DNA. These are known as caretakers. These two mechanisms go hand in hand. Normally, cells are not allowed to complete cell division unless their DNA is error-free. The proteins which oversee DNA repair can also influence cell division. The goal of these proteins is to ensure that only cells with error-free DNA are allowed to complete cell division. Failure of tumor suppressor genes leads to cells which replicate despite having DNA errors or mutations. This allows mutations to accumulate, and eventually this leads to cancer. There are two important things to understand here. First is that tumor suppressor genes protect the genome by ensuring that only cells free of DNA mutations are allowed to progress through the cell cycle. And two, that it is loss of function mutations which promote carcinogenesis. The prototypical tumor suppressor gene is P53, which is known as the guardian of the genome. We discussed P53 in our last video. Now let's talk about oncogenes. Unlike tumor suppressor genes, oncogenes have no role in regulating the cell cycle or DNA repair. Instead, oncogenes function as powerful inducers of cell division and prevention of cell death, aka cell survival. Oncogenes code for proteins which stimulate cell division and survival. They typically act as molecular switches which can activate multiple pathways involved in cell division and cell survival. Unlike tumor suppressors, it is mutations which lead to gain of function and not loss of function which lead to carcinogenesis. That is, mutations which enhance the function of proteins are the type of mutations which lead to carcinogenesis when talking about oncogenes. Oncogenes which are not mutated are called proto-oncogenes. Once a proto-oncogene becomes mutated and is dysfunctional, it is termed an oncogene. So how do oncogenes promote cancer? Oncogenes code for proteins which are involved in signaling for cell division and cell survival such as growth factors, growth factor receptors, signal transduction proteins, and transcription factors. Normally, these proteins are switched off until cell division is required. However, Mutations can lead to situations in which they are permanently turned on. What you need to know is that oncogenes typically code for proteins which have an on or off state, and these proteins typically can activate multiple simultaneous molecular pathways for cell division and cell survival. Oncogenes cause cancer when mutations occur that cause the protein to be permanently in the on state and never in the off state. The type of mutation involved in oncogenes are gain-of-function mutations. This makes sense because the protein is functioning when it is not supposed to be functioning. Therefore, this is a gain-of-function mutation. Okay, now let's take some time to talk about inherited cancer syndromes. The overwhelming majority of cancer instances are sporadic. That is, they are not inherited. Approximately 5-10% to 10 of all cancer instances are familial or inherited. That is, they tend to run in families and the risk of developing these cancers can be passed down to generations. 
most causes of inherited cancer is due to germline mutations in tumor suppressor genes, which can be passed down to new generations. Familial cancer syndromes and the principles of inheritance of familial cancer syndromes are extremely high yield for the exam. In order to understand these principles, we need to talk about somatic and germline mutations. Mutations can be categorized based on whether they occur in gametes such as sperm and egg cells or in non-gamete cells. If a mutation occurs or is present in sperm and egg cells, they are termed germline mutations. Since the DNA in every cell is derived from a sperm cell and an egg cell, germline mutations will be present in every cell of the organism. An example of this is a child born with a germline retinoblastoma gene mutation. Every cell in their body, including the sex cells, will have this mutation. Mutations which occur in non-gametes or in non-sex cells are termed somatic. These mutations cannot be inherited since they are not present in the organism's germline or sex cells. An example of this is a person with a RAS mutation in their pancreatic tumor. Only the cells of the pancreas have this mutation. Since there are no mutations of RAS in the gametes or the sex cell, this mutation cannot be passed down. It is important to realize that somatic mutations account for most of the mutations seen in most tumors. Okay, so now let's talk about the two-hit hypothesis. Whenever we talk about the two-hit hypothesis, we are referring to tumor suppressor genes and how they are inherited. The two-hit hypothesis refers to the fact that in order for a cell to progress towards cancer, both copies of a tumor suppressor must be inactivated. Remember, every cell in the body has two copies of every gene. As we will soon learn, most causes of inherited cancer syndromes occur due to germline mutation in one copy of a tumor suppressor gene. Approximately 10% of all cancers are associated with an inherited cancer syndrome, while the remaining 90% are sporadic. In cases of inherited cancer syndromes, children typically inherit a germline mutation in one copy of their tumor suppressor gene. That is, every single cell in their body has only one functional copy of a tumor suppressor gene. This is called the first hit. The first hit occurs at conception. Over time, the remaining functional tumor suppressor gene is mutated and becomes dysfunctional. This typically occurs as a result of a somatic mutation. This is the second hit. This is exactly what occurs in retinoblastoma, which we discussed in the previous video. It is extremely important to realize that as long as there is one functional copy of a tumor suppressor gene, cancer cannot occur as this functional gene is sufficient to prevent carcinogenesis. Another important implication of the two-hit hypothesis is that it explains why most inherited cancer syndromes are inherited as autosomal dominant. In order to understand why this is the case, let's draw it out using Punnett squares. Let's take for example a tumor suppressor R. Let's say that the functional version of gene R is denoted as capital R or big R and the non-function or mutated version is denoted as little r or lowercase r. Let's say an organism with a germline mutation in one copy of tumor suppressor R such that their genotype is big R and little r mates with an organism with no germline mutation in the R gene such that their genotype is capital R and capital R. If we draw this out, we will see that 50% of all the progeny or offspring will inherit a copy of little r and big R and the rest will inherit two capital R's. This should look rather familiar to you. It is an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. Remember, autosomal dominant means that only one copy of a gene is needed to express the phenotype. In this case, the phenotype is either cancer or no cancer. Those organisms with little r will carry a germline mutation of tumor suppressor R and therefore will only have a single functional copy of tumor suppressor R in each of their cells. Although these organisms will not be born with cancer, 
they have an increased risk of developing cancer because they only need a single somatic mutation in one cell to occur in order to completely knock out their tumor suppressor. Compared to an organism with two functional copies of their tumor suppressor in each cell, it is much less likely for a single cell to lose both copies via somatic mutations. The way that I like to think of autosomal dominant cancer syndromes is that it is the increased risk of cancer which is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion and not the cancer itself. Okay, so now let's compare tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. In this table I have summarized all of the main differences between the two. Both oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are involved in carcinogenesis. However, the mechanisms by which they promote carcinogenesis differ. Let's start with the normal function of oncogenes and tumor suppressors. Under normal circumstances, oncogenes promote cell division, whereas tumor suppressors prevent cell division. Next, let's look at the prototypical function of tumor suppressor and oncogene proteins. Oncogenes typically code for receptors or signal transduction proteins. On the other hand, tumor suppressor genes code for proteins involved in DNA repair and regulation of the cell cycle. Next, the number of mutations required to cause cancer differ. As we mentioned before, a tumor suppressor gene only needs a single functional copy to exhibit its effect. Basically, one copy is as good as two copies. Therefore, you need to knock out both copies of a tumor suppressor in a cell in order to promote carcinogenesis. Another way to say this is that you need homozygous mutations in a tumor suppressor. Unlike tumor suppressors, most oncogenes only need a single mutation in a single copy of a gene to promote carcinogenesis. In other words, you need heterozygous mutations. Next, oncogenes typically require gain-of-function mutations to promote carcinogenesis, while tumor suppressors typically need a loss-of-function mutation. Next, oncogenes are rarely associated with germline mutations, whereas tumor suppressors are frequently associated with germline mutations. This is the reason why familial cancer syndromes are due to mutations in tumor suppressor genes most of the time. Lastly, both tumor suppressors and oncogenes are associated with somatic mutations. This makes sense since most cancers are sporadic and due to somatic mutations. In this table, I have summarized some of the most frequently tested tumor suppressors and their associated syndromes. We will go more in depth on each of these in the next video, but for now I want you to notice a few things. Notice how the function of all of these tumor suppressor genes involves the cell cycle and DNA repair. APC, which is involved in familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome, aka FAP, codes for a protein which normally breaks down another protein called beta-catenin. Beta-catenin is a powerful inducer of cell division, therefore APC is involved in control of the cell cycle through control of intracellular beta-catenin levels. Another thing I want you to notice is that all of these mutations are associated with autosomal dominant familial cancer syndromes. Now let's take a look at some of the most common oncogenes. In this list I have summarized some of the most well understood and commonly tested oncogenes. Again, we will go over these in detail in the next video. For now, let's just make a few observations. First, out of all of these oncogenes, only the red oncogene is associated with a familial cancer syndrome. Mutations in RAS, HER2, and ABL are almost always described in the context of somatic mutations. Germline mutations in ABL, HER2, RAS and pretty much any other oncogene are extremely rare and are not a frequent cause of familial cancer syndromes. The RET mutation is the only exception to this. It is associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, which is known to cause medullary thyroid cancer, pheochromocytomas, and parathyroid hyperplasia. MEN2 is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. The next thing I want you to notice is the function of oncogenes. Unlike tumor suppressors which code for proteins involved in the control of the cell cycle and DNA repair, 
oncogenes code for receptors and proteins involved in signal transduction. In other words, these proteins are involved in signal pathways for cell division and cell survival. The last thing I want to cover in this video is the principle that it usually takes multiple mutations in different oncogenes and tumor suppressors for cancer to develop. It is very rare for a single mutation in a single oncogene or tumor suppressor to promote carcinogenesis. This principle is best shown in the classic adenoma carcinoma pathway for colorectal cancer. In this model for colorectal cancer carcinogenesis, a series of mutations in various oncogenes and tumor suppressors must occur before colon cancer develops. As you can see here, a single mutation such as loss of APC does not lead to cancer. For cancer to develop, mutations in APC, KRAS, and P53 must all occur in the same cell. What I want you to understand here is that cancer requires multiple mutations in various genes to occur. A single mutation is rarely enough to lead to cancer. This leads us to the principle of chromosomal instability. Under normal circumstances, random mutations are not enough to produce all of the mutations required for carcinogenesis to occur. For all of these mutations to occur, the cell must have a predisposition for making errors in DNA or DNA mutations. Chromosomal instability refers to an abnormal increase in the rate of DNA errors or mutations. Chromosomal instability is believed to be involved in most cancers as most tumors studied have chromosomal instability. Chromosomal instability is believed to occur as a result of defective DNA repair mechanisms.